Thanks everyone for joining us today. Welcome to the CNCF live webinar, Hacking Cloud Native Applications Through Open Source. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then I'll hand over to Arthur Oliarsh, security researcher with Palo Alto Networks. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee, but there's a chat box on the side. Feel free to add and drop your questions there throughout the webinar and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is code to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link you use today and also on our online programs YouTube playlist post event. With that, I will hand it over to Arthur to kick off today's presentation. Um, thank you, Libby, for uh, the introduction. So uh, good day, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Ar Arthur Liarsh, and I'm a security researcher uh, for Palo Alto Networks. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy uh, do the most is uh, I like to look at different kind of project, which uh, mostly uh, open source project, and I like to peek into the code and look uh, into what the developers might do wrong and how uh, could I exploit it and target application which are using those code and those packages or modules. Uh, so, and today I'm going to talk about a bit about the security in cloud native uh, open source projects. Uh, if you will have any questions uh, by the end of this presentation, um, please drop them in the text boxes below. And uh, by the end of the presentation, I will try to address as many questions as I can. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's get started. Um, our agenda for today would be, firstly, we're going to go uh, on a very high level on why applications, uh, why organizations shifting their applications to the cloud and how they shifting the services to the cloud. Uh, what is the open source software role uh, which helps them to achieve this goal? Also, we will take a look at some of the challenges and concerns organization might have when shifting the application to the cloud. I will show you some vulnerabilities observed in open source uh, cloud native uh, world and uh, show you even uh, some examples on how I can use some of the vulnerabilities to attack an application which is running within the cloud. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can reduce the risk and mitigate against those attacks even early in the development life cycle. So uh, let's get started. Uh, why organization choosing to uh, move their application or services to the cloud? So there is a lot of reasons to do so, and I decided to uh, briefly go over some of the reasons. So it depends on how big your organization is, it may reduce you some cost. When you're running your uh, service or application into the in the cloud, you don't need to maintain a, a server farm. You don't need to also maintain an IT staff, which is taking care of all the service, right? Which is quite trivial. Uh, also, you don't need to rent a physical space where you will place all the service and IT staff and will uh, save some money on energy, which all is that consuming. Uh, in terms of scalability, uh, you want that your uh, ID infrastructure will adopt your business needs. For example, if you're planning to uh, double the amount of users you have. So if your service is uh, in, based on the cloud, uh, when your uh, database uh, need to grow, you just space, you go for more storage and you get it immediately. And you don't need to uh, uh, build uh, before ahead of the time uh, a new uh, data storage uh, or, uh, database or, or servers. Uh, and you don't know if you're ever going to use it. Uh, fault tolerance, which means uh, if one of the components fails, uh, you will have immediately a backup available within seconds if you're running your service on the cloud. And you don't need to maintain a physical copy, uh, which is another data center somewhere of your uh, service, which costs you additional amount of money. You just want to uh, use your backup and when you need it and pay for it. Uh, in terms of performance and regulations, uh, you want to be uh, as close as possible to your audience and clients uh, and uh, 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 cloud uh, service providers. They have a lot of servers uh, across the globe. 
and this is how uh, uh, the performance can uh, be improved because all the services are located in in countries where your clients are uh, so like how uh, organization are achieving those goals how they start uh, planning and shifting uh, to the cloud so according uh, to uh, Gartner uh, research that was made in 2010, which is a long time ago, right? Uh, but still uh, somehow relevant uh, to these days, they came up with uh, what's so-called uh, five R's, which is the five approaches organizations are taking uh, when they want to shift to the cloud. So one of the approaches is called to rehost, or also known as uh, shift and lift, which basically means that you're taking your application, which is installed on bare metal, and you are reinstalling it in, into the cloud. Maybe you want to uh, containerize it and, and, and run it uh, as a VM within the cloud, right? You basically take your application and reinstalling it within the cloud. The second approach is uh, revise, which basically means that you maybe uh, want to take a small portion of your application and adjust it to uh, benefit from uh, the cloud uh, provided services that what they have to offer. Maybe you want to uh, move your storage to the cloud, for example. Uh, the third approach would be a refactor, where you are uh, refactoring an application to uh, run on the uh, cloud provider's infrastructure. So you could benefit uh, from more services that they have to offer. Uh, the fourth uh, method is, uh, in my opinion, uh, more of a cloud native approach, uh, which means that you rebuild your application from scratch. You're taking all of your code and you rewrite your code. Uh, so like you uh, build a new architecture of how your application is will look on the cloud. So basically you are building for the cloud in the cloud. And this is uh, the place uh, where uh, open source software uh, tools, cloud native open source software tools really uh, can come in handy because, because like you are going to look for new solutions and sometimes you don't have the time to build your own cloud native solution from scratch. You will be, you, so you turn it to uh, some open source software available out there. Uh, the, the fifth approach I didn't mention here and it calls replace or repurchase, uh, which basically means that you take your application, you put it aside and you uh, buy a new application, uh, software as a service, which is, will run on the cloud and made for the cloud. So let's take a look at what our open source software role uh, with this, uh, uh, with all this uh, migration process. So uh, first of all, using open source will reduce your costs because now your development teams will need to find new, new solutions to new problems and adopt your application to, uh, to be a cloud native. So uh, in terms of development, uh, they don't need to build a whole new solution from scratch. They just find the right tool and they adjust it to your needs. You also don't need to pay for uh, licenses for open source software, right? Uh, so it uh, reduces some of the costs. And because like your uh, teams don't need to build a new solution from scratch, it saves some time. As we know, uh, time is money today, right? Uh, it's platform neutral, which is very important in my opinion. When you build your solution with open source software, you can run it on any platform. So let's say you're running your uh, uh, service on uh, some provider X and you want to switch later to provider Y for some reasons. You don't need to uh, rebuild your application or readjust it because your uh, application is ready to go on any platform. This is a, a really uh, cool feature to be a platform neutral, innovative. Uh, in my opinion, people uh, who are uh, participating in building new solutions and sharing it with the community, uh, they're looking to solve creatively uh, some existing problems uh, and they do it uh, sometimes in a really brilliant way and they share it with the community and all the software becomes available to everybody. Uh, so you really benefit from uh, cutting edge solutions uh, free to use. Uh, there are different solutions to the same problem. So you have a different tools which, which basically solve the same problem and you just need the one which will suit you. Uh, so you just not uh, uh, having a one solution for some problem, right? Uh, also, it's maintained by people uh, from a uh, cloud native community where, where cloud technologies is not something new to them. And this is where I find it really in, uh, educational uh, because like when your developers start to uh, 
starting that learning curve, de developing uh, their applications uh, uh, for uh, to be cloud native. Uh, for example, if you are using some module or a package that uh, you are not sure how you should implement it, so you just go to the registry, which is open source. Uh, for example, GitHub, you open an issue and you ask a question, and sometimes and some people from the community or even the maintainers will start to uh, try to answer it, or or people who already saw uh, or uh, had the same issue will give you an answer that will can help you. Which and all of that together makes the application uh, migration to the cloud easier and faster. So uh, I saw some uh, really cool uh, research that was done by Cloud Native Computing Foundation, where they asked uh, some people from a lot of organization if they are adopting a cloud native open source projects uh, within uh, on, on production, or are they uh, thinking uh, to using it. Maybe they have some something or staging they're testing it, and the numbers are are really really high. As you can see, uh, Kubernetes is adopted by 96% uh, of the people who answered the survey, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, crazy. Also, I think that uh, the numbers here are uh, going to uh, be higher with the following years because more and more organization will shift part of their services or all of their services within to the cloud. So uh, are there any challenges and concerns uh, that organization have when they're trying to uh, shift their applications to the cloud. So uh, this kind of a trivial question because there are a lot of uh, challenges and concerns. And uh, let's say it's just complex because now uh, your development team need to uh, re re rebuild your application from scratch. And they are trying to ask a lot of questions and start like a, a learning curve. They, they, they raising a lot of questions like, okay, um, what is a Kubernetes cluster? What is Anatomy? Uh, how should I containerize my application? How microservices need to communicate between each other? What are role-based access controls? Uh, what uh, service mesh should we apply? Uh, what orchestration tool we need to choose? And all of these uh, questions have answers out there. So online, there is a tons of resources today uh, where you can read and start building something. But uh, to take all of these pieces that are available out there and uh, bring it together to make a working solution will take a lot of time, which can slow down a uh, development process. So lack of proper training will really uh, slow down a, a, a development uh, process. And uh, this is where like, sometimes you start to uh, think or, or maybe question yourself, maybe I need to hire a new staff, which is more cloud uh, native oriented and stuff like that. So also it's hard to choose the right tools because there are a lot of open source tools available out there and you don't know which one best will suit your needs, which is also takes a lot of research. Uh, all of this raises also a lot of security concern, concerns. And actually there is a cool survey again done by uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation where they ask an organization about cloud native security concern they have. And one I want to mention here is a vulnerability management one. Uh, basically, uh, let's say you built an application already. You maybe you have it on staging or even in production. And let's say you applied some security audit to your application or service, and you scanned the images, you scanned your dependencies, uh, and now you have a bunch of vulnerabilities going on. May have compliance uh, issues and vulnerabilities and packages you're using, and you have like a long, long list of vulnerabilities and you just need to solve them one by one. So you kind of need to prioritize all those vulnerabilities and address those. So this is not a trivial question, which vulnerability should I fix first? Uh, because fixing vulnerabilities, it's very time consuming and doing it in the right way, it's very hard. So sometimes just like updating a package version, module version, it's not enough because it can break things in your uh, uh, development and it's not a, a great solution. Maybe there is a workaround available. So uh, all these things are really, really uh, time consuming and uh, vulnerability management is a very, very uh, hard uh, task to do. And this is, uh, I'm not surprised why it's like on top of the list. Also, another uh, thing which uh, caught my eye is that uh, organization been asked about uh, security incidents, which is cloud native related. So uh, 
almost 50% uh, answered that they prefer not to disclose. So what we learn from it, we'll basically learn from it that there was uh, the pretty much high percent that, that there was a security incident, but they don't want to talk about it. And the second one is the vulnerability exploited, uh, which we will talk about today. Uh, and I think that's very important because when you're applying uh, new technologies and new tools, you are using open source uh, packages and modules. You may be uh, using a, a not updated version. Maybe you are using a default configuration. You can misuse many things and many things can go wrong and expose your uh, bigger uh, uh, application and services to uh, security uh, breaches and attacks. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at vulnerabilities uh, which are observed in open source and what they are and what types of vulnerabilities there. So uh, what I did, uh, I took a list of uh, very known uh, projects by Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, uh, which consists of uh, more than 100 projects. And I searched for a NVD database and uh, for a GitHub repository, uh, GitHub advisories to see how many vulnerabilities can I find. So I found out that between uh, 2021 to 2022, uh, there were 164 vulnerabilities registered. So, uh, and I tried to, uh, to put them into groups by type. And we can see that there are three groups which are uh, really uh, catching our eye. One of, one of them is like denial of service vulnerabilities. Second one is code execution and directory traversal. Where, where we're looking at directory traversal and code execution vulnerabilities are almost always uh, high to uh, critical severity. And you never want that your application will be exposed to one of those vulnerabilities, right? So uh, I also uh, think that if we will uh, expand the, this research to all of the cloud native open source uh, software, uh, the number will be uh, very high. Um, and it's not like means that uh, I, I, I think like, uh, for example, I, see, I saw some uh, rising numbers between 2021 to 2022. And I think uh, the numbers are getting higher as a security awareness, uh, getting uh, more attention in the cloud native uh, landscape. Uh, so I was thinking uh, how hard is to pick some vulnerabilities from the list that I found uh, to see and how uh, some uh, application could be attacked. So I pick up some vulnerabilities from the list that I want to share with you and show how uh, some uh, application running within the cloud can be attacked by, with them. So let's see some examples. So let's say we have a microservices application running with a Kubernetes cluster, and we have uh, two services. One is a public service and one is a secret service. We have an Envoy proxy which is uh, handling all ingress traffic and navigating whether to the public service or the secret service with some access policy applied. Also, we have a continuous delivery uh, solution, which is a Argo CD, uh, which is a continuous delivery uh, cloud native solution. Uh, and let's say that uh, Envoy proxy is not up to date and it's containing uh, known vulnerabilities. Also, let's say that uh, Argo CD is not up to date and Argo CD server is publicly exposed with anonymous access enabled. Um, just don't worry about the anonymous access and what it is. We will elaborate on it uh, further. And uh, just to say that anonymous access is not enabled by default, but we'll explain it later. So in that in mind, what can go wrong? So let me uh, introduce you to a vulnerability that was found for Envoy Proxy. Um, so this vulnerability, it took advantage of uh, a URL path normalization. So uh, the way uh, URL paths are treated is very important because uh, once th they are not normalized and treated well, it can expose you for a different variety of uh, security vulnerability, one of which is the past traversal. And by that, I mean, uh, where is no, where is, where there is no uh, path normalization in place. For example, a relative path like root public and a segment with double dot and admin can trick your access uh, access policy. 
Uh, in some systems, a double dot segment means that you want to go to the parent directory, which in this example means that you will simply go not to public admin, but double dot will go up to a, to a parent directory, which is root, and then you will end up with root admin if there is no path normalization in place. If we were applying a path normalization, it was ending up with root public admin without the double dot segment because it was sanitized, and then you were not granting access to the resource. So with that in mind, the attack scenario would be an attacker would grab a request with a uh, crafted URL containing uh, relative uh, relative path containing double dot segment. The proxy will receive this URL, and due to lack of path normalization, the access policy will be bypassed, and we will get to the resource we should not get to. So, an attacker will send an HTTP request containing a crafted URL. Uh, let's say your shop com public service double dot secret service and when it will be uh, parsed by uh, a proxy uh, the, it will say like okay you want to go to the public service but where you want to reach within the public service let's say access access policy is uh, allowing us to go whenever we want within the public service so it says okay where in the public service you want to go so it sees the double dot and secret service and since there's not normalizing the path, it goes up to the root directory and navigates to the secret service. And that's how we bypassed the uh, access policy. So if we will go into straight to the secret service by your shop com secret service, we was denied the access by the access policy. But as simple as that, using the double dot segment, we were able to bypass the policy and get to the secret service. So uh, this is a classic bus reversal attack. Another vulnerability I want to share with you, it was discovered for Argo CD project and more specifically for Argo CD server. So this vulnerability uh, could elevate privileges uh, taking advantage of uh, JSON web token authentication. And basically uh, Argo CD uh, trusted invalid claims within the JSON web token. Basically JSON web token is a token which made up of three parts. It comes in an encoded part within the authorization header. And once decoded, it gets the following uh, structure. It consists of a header, payload, and signature. Whether When the payload contains the claims, claims are just uh, parameters describing things about a user. In most cases, it's a user. So for example, it can state that the user is an admin for how long this token is uh, valid and etc. So once Argo CD has anonymous users enabled, which can be enabled via the Argo CD config map YAML file, uh, the anonymous users will get the default role permission specified in Argo CD Rabak config map. And Rabak is just a feature which is restricts data to Argo CD instances. And default role basically means that you will have a read only access to all of the Argo CD uh, resources. So in that in mind, if we continue reading uh, the description of this vulnerability, we will see that the attacker will not need to have an account on Argo CD instance to exploit this vulnerability. Also, he can impersonate the uh, he can uh, impersonate a user, a built-in user, which is admin account on the Argo CD. And once he's escalated the privileges, he will be able to get the privileges, the same privileges on the cluster as the Argo CD instance, which is by default the cluster admin. So basically, with forging a GWT with some uh, with forging GWT claims, which is JSON Web Token claims, which I talked before, uh, which I talked about before, you can become a cluster admin, which basically allows you to delete and add uh, or manip or manipulate in some other way the resources on the cluster, which is pretty crazy. So the attacker will send a request with a forged GWT containing invalid claims. And when Argo CD authentication will trust the uh, forged GWT token, it will allow us to become a cluster admin. Now, this is uh, really uh, crazy. Once uh, this can, if this can happen, this is a really cool vulnerability also because Argo CD sometimes receiving and pulling information from uh, some GitHub repository, right? 
And this is uh, where another attack vector uh, uh, that can be shown to the to the attacker. Now, now he maybe can later uh, exploit all of the uh, CI/CD pipeline. So uh, another thing is that some vulnerabilities uh, can hide. Uh, and if you remember, the first vulnerability that I introduced you is was that fast traversal vulnerability within Envoy Proxy. So what's so big deal? So uh, this vulnerability was first uh, reported to Istio uh, in February 18 uh, by a security researcher. So uh, Istio uh, investigated it further and they found out that the issue is within the Envoy proxy. Istio, if someone don't know, it's like a service mesh where it injects uh, Envoy proxy as a sidecar to each uh, pod within the cluster. So you see how it's complex it gets. One project which is using Envoy proxy becomes vulnerable uh, because the other project have a uh, normalization issue. So uh, Istio reported this issue to Envoy proxy team and Envoy proxy and, and Envoy uh, opened a publicly available uh, issue on the GitHub repository. And if we will look closely at the issue that was opened, so uh, we, a technical person can read through this and say, hey, uh, I can I can pretty much uh, understand what's going on, and I maybe can try out and write some past traversal exploit for uh, and see if it's working. Uh, and uh, if I'm an attacker and I know that uh, my target is running a, a cloud native proxy, even if I don't know if that invoice proxy or other proxy uh, out there, uh, I maybe want to target all the publicly available. Uh, cloud native uh, proxy repositories, right? And see for and scan for issues and pull requests that are available publicly to see if there is any hints that can point out to some security weakness, which I might exploit. Uh, so after the issue was realized and the severity was realized by the Moi team, they moved to a private fix process, which is, was already after 20 days after the issue was pushed. So uh, there was a 20 days gap so uh, someone could pick up an exploit. And if you do, if you're thinking that uh, attackers, uh, is this not enough days for an attackers to do something? Uh, so there was already, uh, not related to Envoy, but there was some uh, stories out there that uh, some, some, some things escalated less than uh, two days. So, uh, Hidden vulnerabilities is all of a uh, subject. For example, the vulnerability I just uh, talked about, uh, uh, past traversal and void proxy, this issue on GitHub was available before even the CVE was assigned to the vulnerability. So uh, this is uh, a really big subject. And uh, uh, two buddies and colleagues of mine have a great talk for Linux Foundation, which is called Hidden Vulnerabilities in Open Source which you can uh, watch by uh, typing uh, this uh, hidden vulnerability in open source on YouTube or just check for the link below. Uh, just another small thing to add, uh, not always uh, there, there are to, to this hidden vulnerability subject. Uh, sometimes uh, there are vulnerability, but there is no CV. And the reason is that sometimes developing teams are not aware enough that what they fixed was uh, a security issue that can be exploited uh, unless someone points it out to them. Uh, so there are uh, a lot more reasons to why that happens. And in there, it is like explained in the hidden vulnerabilities in open source uh, talk. So you can pick uh, and see more information. Uh, so uh, how should uh, we reduce uh, the risk uh, how should we uh, mitigate as much as we can uh, against those attacks? So first of all, it is always great to have a map of your application and its building blocks. Uh, you want to see which types of packages, modules, uh, or tools you're using within your uh, solution. And then you want to check for updates and release notes for those uh, entities and see if there is some release notes related to security that you might address. Maybe there is some workaround and no fix yet. If there are fix, maybe you want to patch and update the version. 
Uh, also strongly advise for, to go to a security advisory of your of the projects you are using. Uh, most of the cloud native open source projects are uh, repositories are on GitHub, and GitHub is maintaining a security advisory. You and this is a publicly available. They have also API, and you can search for a project you're using, a module or package, and and see for known vulnerabilities. Uh, also, you can go to NVD and look for uh, known vulnerabilities uh, and CVEs within that database. Also, there are a lot of scanners uh, in open source available, so you can scan for images or dependencies. So you can see if your uh, direct or transitive dependencies have some known vulnerabilities, right? So as you can see, uh, for example, we talked about Istio. The vulnerability for Envoy Proxy was uh, reported from Istio team because Istio team is making use of Envoy. So uh, scanning for that is uh, really, really important. Another great tool is SCA tools. Software composition analysis tools are, uh, there, it's like a, a methodology that show, uh, allows you to track uh, all of your open source uh, modules, packages, and tools that you're using within your project. Uh, and also those tools uh, sometimes uh, really uh, developer friendly. So you can think of uh, how you can integrate them into your CI CD pipeline. So you can regularly scan for those dependencies and packages mo uh, and modules and packages uh, and discover the vulnerabilities early in the uh, CI CD pr process and the software uh, development lifecycle. Uh, also, those tools will help you to prioritize risk, which we talked before, right? So one of the issues, uh, great issues uh, for security teams or engineering teams is that after scanning for the vulnerabilities, they have a long list of vulnerabilities, so they need to know what to uh, prioritize first uh, and, and what to fix first. Sometimes it's not about the critical vulnerability, but it's for the vulnerability that is, can be mostly exploited on your uh, container, for example. Uh, if your container is exposed to the network and running with high privileges, even a uh, medium severity vulnerability can be a real danger. Uh, also, all this information which is gathered uh, uh, and uh, can be shown through uh, SCA tools are maintained by security researchers behind those tools, right? So if you remember, for example, this uh, hidden vulnerabilities topic that I talked uh, previously, uh, there are security research teams which dedicate their time to find those vulnerability. And then they integrate this in the SCA tools. And once you're using them, you get uh, trashed for those vulnerabilities even before they get assigned CVEs. And this is how you can really, really mitigate and, uh, and reduce the risk uh, from your application being exploited or exposed to uh, cyber attacks. So, uh, this is all I have to say for the moment. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I would like to uh, answer them. Uh, thank you. Libby. OK. Anyone have any questions they want to pop into the chat for Arthur? Give them just a minute or so, see if anybody comes up with something. I see some problem in the chat, so uh, I, I don't see the chat. Um, let's see. I'm watching it, and I don't see any questions. Give everybody one more minute. Is there anything else you want to add? Any um, ways to contact you or places they can opt in to find out more information? All right. Well, if no one has any more questions, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Arthur, for the presentation. And these will be online later today. Um, the slides and the presentation will be on the website. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Arthur. And uh, we'll see you all again next time. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good day. <laughs>